Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, can I speak to、uh, the advert? Doesn't give a name. Well, the name is Bob, and I guess this call is about the car I'm selling, right? Yes, my name's Francis, and I'm definitely interested. You'll like my car then. Clean, neat, nice. What sort is it? Oh, the original model was called an Echo. You know, like the Echo a sound can make. But then they changed the name to Yaris just before I bought it. Yaris. I don't know why. I liked the old name, and it's the same car, but that's what it's called. So, what's the colour? The ad says it's cream coloured, like cream. Then. Yeah, well, it, it's more of a yellow colour, actually. Not cream. No, I don't know why I said that. It's like a canary, and it's more like one too. So, what about the power? How many cylinders does it have? Four or six? My brother has a six-cylinder car and says it's very powerful. Well, this one's four only, but I find it fine for city driving. As long as you don't intend to drive this car interstate or across the country, it does the job fine. That's okay. I just want the car basically for commuting to work and maybe some weekend trips. Is it two door or four door? I suppose it's not four door. The car's too small for that, right? Right, just two doors, as you say. The front seat bends forward to allow entry into the rear. That's fine by me. This car is just for my girlfriend and I, anyway. Uh, what about accessories? Radio, CD player, anything else? Does it have an air conditioner? Well, no, it doesn't. But I don't find that a problem. I just open the window. I mean, if you really want, you can pay to have an AC installed. Basically. The only additional feature this car has is a radio, but it's still a great deal. That depends on the price. You say you want twelve thousand eight hundred dollars, right? Yep, about that. Well, obviously you expect the price to be reduced to an even figure, right? Well, I don't know. Twelve thousand dollars. Twelve thousand five hundred, maybe. If you can lower it a bit, I'll come and have a look. Okay. Okay, okay. Let's say twelve thousand four hundred dollars, but I won't lower it any more than that. Certainly not to twelve thousand dollars. Well, if I can get that better price, I may come over this afternoon. But what year is this car? How old is it? My brother's got a twelve-year-old car, and it's showing problems. Well, my car was brand new only three years ago, but it still looks like it's only been one year on the road. Okay. That sounds good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Can I just ask a few more general questions about this car you're selling? Sure. Can you just tell me why you think it's such a good deal? Of course, I won't necessarily believe you, but just tell me what you think. You can believe me. I honestly think this is a nice car, well worth buying at the price I'm asking. How much rego registration does it have left? Oh,、uh, to be honest, not so much. But I think having lots of registration is irrelevant. It's the car you're paying for, the quality and advantages of the engine itself. Well, what about that then? Okay, many people like to accelerate down the freeways, right? There are a lot of speed demons out there who think quickness is all that matters. But basically. People are mostly trapped in city traffic, so one of the things I like is that because this car is small, you can put it anywhere. Say you're in the city, wanting to duck into a shop. Well, you can fit this car in any little space while you go shopping or do other things, and that saves you a lot of time. Yeah, but it's not that powerful, right? 
Oh, sure, the feel of a smoothly purring six-cylinder engine attracts many people, but I compare my car to those small football players with the tight turning circles, those who can run rings around the larger players. This car is like that. It can turn this way and that way, dodge here, duck in there, sneak around corners, squeeze ahead and grab a position. That's also very useful when travelling in city traffic. OK, I'll think about it. Sure, think about it. But all these advantages are sound and appeal to other buyers as well. No one holds the same car forever, so you can say exactly the same things that I just said when you want to sell the car. That will make it very easy for you to pass this car on to the next buyer. Yeah, maybe you're right. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, look at questions 11 to 13. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures. So I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was a very useful experience. Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now. They're a big store. And one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it. Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory. Or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. 
Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study. Mm. And there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills programme, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh, right. I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now, uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um, I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project, mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well, uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report, which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about tea between an expert and a reporter. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 24.
Hi, Jacob. Thank you so much for coming along today. It's my pleasure. I'm very intrigued about what a tea meditation entails exactly. Well, it's very simple, really. I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that it is mostly about leaving everything that you have been thinking or worrying about today to one side. Really focus on the present moment. Oh, it sounds great. I certainly don't know very much about tea, and I'm keen to get started. But before you go into more detail, can I ask you what your favourite kind of tea is? Well. I think the kind of tea we are going to have today is my favourite. It is pu'er tea from Yunnan province in southern China. What makes this tea special? Pu'er is a dark tea. The regions of Yunnan, the north of Vietnam and Laos, have one of the best climates for growing tea in the world. Pu'er is a post-fermented tea. Oh, what is a post-fermented tea exactly? It is a tea that has undergone a period of ageing in the open air. They age the tea for days, even years. The exposure to humidity and oxygen help to oxidize the tea leaves and encourage fermentation. This changes the smell of the tea and also removes a lot of bitterness from the taste. It sounds similar to the process of aging wine. The process is different, but the effect of aging on the taste is certainly similar. Does this mean the tea can be quite expensive? Absolutely. It can be very expensive. The tea is usually pressed into balls or cakes and sold. At one time, only tea enthusiasts cared about buying these cakes, but now many people have realised that they are an investment, and so buy them like they would buy gold because the price goes up a lot over time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So now I want you to focus on clearing your mind of anything other than this present moment. Let go of any concerns. Okay.、Uh, one slight problem. I will need to record our conversation, and I will need to take notes for the article.、Uh, I plan to write about this for my newspaper.、Uh, is that okay? Oh yes, of course. Whatever you need. Thank you. I'll try to keep my notes to a minimum. Good. So where was I? Oh yes, I think very few people really appreciate the complexity and variety of tea that exists in the world. Right. Most people are maybe like me and just use tea bags. Exactly. And with a tea bag, the tea is trapped inside and cannot move around freely. You can really taste the difference drinking a brewed tea that was free to move around through all the water. So, do you ever use tea bags? Never. There are many different kinds of tea: white, yellow, black, green, oolong, matcha, herbal, and many others. Each one has its own unique properties. To fully experience what each tea has to offer, you must brew it in the correct way. I also believe in only drinking tea that is picked and sorted by hand, rather than using mechanical processes. Although it takes more time, the tea made by hand is so much better that it leads to an increase in the tea sales. But in that case, surely if there is more interest in the tea, and with the time-intensive farming process. This means there could be shortages because the demand is higher than the ability to produce it. There were shortages for a while, but then an artificial fermentation process was developed in the 1970s, which helped to speed up the fermentation times. As I mentioned, this process has an aging effect on the taste of pu'er tea that is very similar to the effect on the taste of wine that you get from that fermentation process. Though for pu'er tea today, we are talking about that artificial process. How can they do this artificially? The farmers gather the tea leaves into a big pile, then cover it with a large sheet or tarp. They spray water on the tea every now and then, and therefore fermentation happens faster. 
Usually, the tea is left for 30, 45, 60 or even 90 days still. The farmer will check the tea every few days and just by the feel of the tea, he knows whether it is ready or if it needs more time. Wow, that sounds like a fascinating process. I never realised that there was such a science behind producing tea. Well, now you are ready for the best part, the tasting of it. That sounds like a very good idea to me. So what I will do now is boil the water and we can begin our meditation. What does that entail? We need to focus on only two things. The first is your mind and body. Forget everything that you have been worrying about today. Forget about what you have to do later on or what somebody said to you earlier. Focus on your breathing and on how your body feels. If you have aches and pains, acknowledge them. Pinpoint where there is tension in your body and try to release it. Oh, yes. I can really feel tension in my shoulders. Let it go. Close your eyes if that helps. Take deep breaths in and out. Soon we will drink the tea. When you drink it, think about the taste and how it feels on your tongue. Is it easy to swallow the tea or do you need to gulp it? Can you brew the tea leaves more than once? Oh yes, you can brew some teas more than ten times. Now we will shift to noble silence, focusing only on ourselves and the tea. Enjoy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, 
If smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes? There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, and then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three, but in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive, with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. It meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began. And it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee project, with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the later... That is the end of part 